So I'm calling this lesson Wisdom for the Christian Life. So that's where we're headed. James is, is Wisdom for the Christian Life. I am excited uh, to, to be here with you again today. I really do enjoy teaching New Testament survey. It's, it's a time when I get to do something a little bit different than what I normally do. I'm normally buried in, in some kind of music, but uh, I like to kind of take a break from that. And um, it is work to prepare a lesson, especially when you're looking at a whole book. But uh, when I get here, it's just fun. Because I like, I like sharing these things with you guys, and I appreciate y'all being here. So again, we're looking at James, which is wisdom for the Christian life. And we just call it the pleasure to have well, thank you. Thank you. And thank you, thank you, Robin, for what you said. That was very kind. James 1.22. It says, but prove yourselves doers of the word and not just hearers who deceive themselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer... He is like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror. For once he has looked at himself and gone away, he has immediately forgotten what kind of person he was. But one who has looked intently at the perfect law, the law of freedom, and has continued in it, not having become a forgotful hearer, but an active doer, this person will be blessed in what he does. Will you pray with me? Father God, I thank you for James. I thank you for the wisdom that's contained in the book of James. Uh, Lord, help us uh, to learn how to be complete Christians. Lord, we're not going to be perfect in this life, but help us to take the theology that we know and apply it to our lives. And especially today, help us to learn how James does that and help us, help us to be whole by uh, being faithful, to uh, know the right uh, understanding of Scripture, to have the right doctrine, the right theology, but also uh, help us to be faithful to do right theology, to live in a way that is consistent with what we know to be true. So Lord, help us today to do that. In your name I pray. Amen. So <clears throat> Pastor Jim uh, spoke with you last week about James, and I think for the most part he covered the background material so I'm not going to rehearse with you everything that he said, but one of his main points, at least one of the main points he communicated to me when I asked him about last week, was that even though there have been some throughout church, church history, like, like Martin Luther, who have doubted the place of James as a legitimate book of the Bible, in other words, though there have been some who have called into question James' place in the canon of Scripture, are you guys familiar with that word, canon? The canon is, is what we consider to be the whole of, of what makes up Scripture. There, there have been some that have dialed, doubted that, but we can rest assured that it is a legitimate book of the Bible. And I can, I can certainly see why some people have concerns about James. Martin Luther had a problem with what he thought. James teaches us about the relationship between faith and good works. So that was his problem with, with James. And we'll talk more about that later. But I'll go ahead and lay my cards on the table. I don't think that James is out of step with, with the rest of the New Testament. So you don't have to worry. I don't think the Bible contradicts itself. So I think that there is an explanation for that, and we'll cover that later. But I do understand it. Uh, I do understand why um, when you even look past the question of faith and works, I can understand why Christians might scratch their heads when they come to James, especially if they've just finished reading Paul's letters. So Jesus, I think, is only mentioned by name two or three times in James. He's, he's all over the place, obviously, because the teaching that's in James is, is for the most part, directly taken from the, the teachings of Jesus, especially in Matthew. But Jesus is only mentioned by name maybe a few times. Um, there's no mention of the cross. There's no mention of the resurrection. The Spirit is, is not really mentioned in a clear way. And it seems to be heavy on commands and light on grace. Okay, so those things might be true, but I think it's unfair for us to expect every book in the, ne in the New Testament to be as theologically loaded as Romans or Ephesians or Hebrews or some of those other heavyweights. As Christians... Um, there comes a time when we need not only to believe, we've got to believe and do. We've got to believe 
and do. So there comes a time when we've got to put our faith into practice. And that's where James comes in. Uh, from James, we learn that it, that it does us no good to be hearers of the word and not also doers of the word. That's the, that's the passage that I read. So it, it does us no good if we hear the word only and, and don't also uh, do what the word says to do. So I've heard it said that the book of James is a little bit like, like salt. All right, you, 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 shouldn't, you shouldn't eat only salt for a meal, but when you season a good meal with salt, it completes the meal. So in the same way, you can't just read James and come to a full understanding of who Jesus is, but if you, if you take what the rest of the New Testament tells you about Jesus... And then you add the practical wisdom that comes from James, you'll be well on your way to becoming a complete Christian. And what do I mean by that? A complete Christian not only believes the right things, but does the right things. So we're looking at, we're looking at how we can be whole spiritually. So in order to be spiritually whole, there needs to be an element in our lives of, of right belief, and there needs to be an element of right practice. And James gives us the practical insight and how to make sure we've got, we've got both elements in our lives. So James is very much a, a practical book. And besides the fact that Jesus was completely God and we aren't, the difference between Jesus and us is that Jesus' right way of believing always, always led to his right way of living. So who he said he was and what he did were always perfectly consistent. I had a professor in seminary, um, the dean of the, the school of music that I, I went to, who said that we know we're becoming more like Jesus when what we say we believe and what we do begin to, begin to line up. So James helps us do that. And there really is no single theme in James, no single unifying theme, but we can understand James as wisdom for the Christian life. So that's, that's the title that I've got. And that means that James largely assumes that we understand the basics of Christian belief, and he gives us several snapshots of what it looks like for right belief to, to be put into practice. So if wisdom is anything, wisdom is using knowledge correctly. Have you heard that before? Wisdom is, is using knowledge correctly. And James teaches us how to use the knowledge of our way of our, of our faith in a way that is, that is pleasing to God, in a way that is, is fitting. And so much like the Old Testament has Proverbs, the New Testament has James. And some people consider James to be part of, of the Bible's wisdom, wisdom literature. So James is like if, if you combine the wisdom of Proverbs uh, with, with some of the bite of the Old Testament prophets. You know how when you read some of the Old Testament prophets and you just set your Bible down and you say, wow, I am really bad off. <laughs> so, so James, he doesn't leave us in that state of discouragement necessarily, but there is some bite to what he has to say. So there's wisdom and there's bite like, like in the prophets. So I call it muscular wisdom. It's pointed wisdom, muscular wisdom. That's what James is. All right, everybody clear on where we're headed? So we're, we're looking at James to see how we can be whole Christians. And James gives us the, uh, the wisdom to be able to do that. So a little bit scattershot today because James touches on so many topics. But we're just going to talk briefly about uh, 10 different teachings that, that James has to offer us. I always forget which way to point. There we go. So that first section, I'm calling Wisdom for Suffering and Temptation. And the thrust of his message here in the first section is that we need to use suffering and temptation, that we need to see suffering and temptation as an opportunity to endure and to grow in our faith. Um, I think Pastor Jim spent a little bit of time on these verses, so I won't spend a lot of time, uh, but I think we can learn two principles from this first section. First is that suffering is an opportunity for growth. Suffering is an opportunity for growth. And I don't mean to make light of suffering, and the Bible doesn't make light of suffering either. And I'll admit that on the whole, I've suffered very little 
in my life. Uh, so I've still got a lot to learn about what it means to suffer and endure in suffering. But as Christians, we must view suffering not as a nuisance or as a sign that God has abandoned us. We must view suffering as a means by which our faith is being perfected. So nothing sanctifies like suffering. So James says it's the testing of your faith that produces endurance. So it's fairly easy for me to articulate that principle right now because I'm not suffering, and I'm sure it would be much harder for me to view suffering as a growth opportunity if I was actually suffering, okay? Um, it makes me a little bit nervous that the past three times that I've taught that this topic has come up. So, yeah, maybe the Lord is trying to prepare me for something, and I pray that he is not. Um, but, <laughs> but it's the consistent of, uh, teaching of the New Testament that suffering is a necessary part of the Christian life. It's not a bug. It's not, it's not a sign that something is malfunctioning in your life. It's actually um, a feature of, of the Christian life. So we all know the verse here in James chapter 1. James 1, five says that if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who, who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. So I don't believe we're to take this verse as an open invitation to become the next Solomon. Right? Remember that story of Solomon and, and the Lord asked him what he wanted, and he said, you know, I'll, I want to be the, the wisest person you know, I want to I have, have wisdom. And then God counters and says, well, you're going to be the most wise person who, who ever lived. Um, I don't think that's what's going on here. What James means by lacking in wisdom is lacking in wisdom to understand that our suffering is leading to our growth. So our suffering is making us whole. Our suffering is driving us to our knees and humbling us and making us rely on God, the only one who can save us. So according to James, suffering is a joy because ultimately it humbles us and reminds us that we need the Lord. So suffering is an opportunity for growth, according to James. Second, uh, though God may use suffering and temptation for our good, he's not the author of suffering and temptation. So it is both true that God is sovereign over everything and that when we mess up, it's our fault. Those things are both true. That God guide and directs everything. He's sovereign over everything. He created everything. He's the ruler of everything. The Bible is clear on that again and again and again. And the Bible is also clear that, that we have responsibility for our actions. So when we suffer or when things go wrong for us uh, because we've sinned, it might be tempting to say, that uh, because God is sovereign, because he guides and directs all things, that God is the problem in our lives. But James, uh, he nips this thinking in the bud. So you remember Barney Fife? Nip it. Nip it in the bud. James nips this thinking in the bud. He says, every good and perfect thing comes from God, and God is always faithful, and God never changes. So there's no evil in God, so God can't, therefore, tempt us to do evil. So the teaching of Scripture that, is that God is in, is in complete control. And uh, while we're responsible for the free decisions uh, that we make, it is also true, again, that God is in complete control. And I don't know how all of this works out. So if you ask me questions about it, I'm probably just going to tell you to look at Deuteronomy 29.29. 29. Do you know what that says? It says, the secret things belong to the Lord our God. But the things revealed belong to us and to our sons forever, so that we may follow all the words of the law. And I, and I quote that a little bit tongue-in-cheek, but I think it applies here. I'm going to read it again. The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things revealed belong to us. And to our sons forever, so that we may follow all the words of the law. In other words, there are things we don't know about God, but everything we need to know about Him, He's told us. And we're responsible, and we're, um, we, are, we are bound to what he's, he's told us. And we are responsible to uh, do the right things. So when we mess up, is it on God? 
No, it's on us because God has told us what is right and what is wrong. So we can't blame God for our trials and sufferings, even while we understand that he is sovereign over them. He works through them and and we ask him to guide and direct us through our trials and our suffering. So I I dare say any questions about that? Good, (laughs) because I don't know that I have any answers for how those things to work out together. Okay. That is snapshot one. Snapshot two is we're calling wisdom for consistent living. So James um, teaching about, about being a consistent Christian centers around what we've already said. It centers around not only hearing the word of God, but doing the word of God. And he begins this section here in, in chapter 1, verses 19 to 27, verse like this, he says, You know this, my beloved brothers and sisters. Everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. For a man's anger does not bring about the righteousness of God. In other words, James is saying when you approach the word of God, you need to have an attitude of reverence. So don't approach the, the scriptures like a textbook that you can master. Approach them with the expectation that they have something to teach you. Listen intently and be humble. Accept Scripture's truths without grumbling uh, or unhealthy doubt. And I'll admit that sometimes I, I don't necessarily doubt the Scriptures. Sometimes I have a problem with approaching the Scriptures, like I said, like they're a textbook. Like they're just a bunch of things that I need to learn and master. And we do need to study the Bible intently. We need to be like the Bereans who search the scriptures. But we don't search the scriptures just to have all the answers. We've got to let the scriptures make a difference in in how we live. We've got to to let them wash over us and and trickle down from our brain to our hearts and and change uh, the the way that that we act. Uh, James goes on to say, it's not enough just to hear the word. You've got to actually apply the word to, to your life. You, you must actually do uh, what the word says you must do. And James compares uh, someone who hears the word only to someone who looks into a mirror and then forgets what he looks like when he walks away. So as followers of Christ, we've been made in the image of Christ. So when we read the scriptures, when we read about who Christ is, we aren't just reading words on a page. We're getting a glimpse into who God has made us to be. Does that make sense? So when we read the Bible, uh, when we read in the Bible about the way that, that we're supposed to live, we're meant to see a reflection of who we are, or at least who, who we're becoming, who we're meant to be. So after reading and hearing the word, if we walk away and ignore the word's demands, then we essentially forget who God has made us to be and is making us to be. But this is what verse 25 says. But one who has looked intently at the perfect law, the law of freedom, and has
Check, check one, two. Ah, oh, there we go. You know, I, I almost thought to bring an extra set of batteries uh, today. I'm sorry I didn't. I, um, I had two bars when I started, and I figured I could make it all the way through. But uh, I didn't even make it a quarter of the way through, so oh well. That's right. And you know what? I'm surprised that's never happened to me on a Sunday morning. Yeah, so uh, the Lord's kind, I guess. But you guys are gracious people, so we'll just keep going. All right, we were talking about, um, yeah, verse 25. It says, but one who has looked intently at the perfect law, the law of freedom, and has continued in it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an active doer, this person will be blessed in what he does. And the one uh, who is a doer of, of the word uh, does these two things, according to James. So uh, first, he bridles his tongue. You see that? He bridles his tongue. In uh, James chapter 1, verse 26, it says, If anyone thinks himself to be religious, yet does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this person's religion is worthless. So someone who does the word bridles his tongue, and he cares... For, for orphans and widows. So these two ideas are going to show up again in James's uh, letter later, but he goes ahead and tells us here that the one who hears and does the word of God controls his tongue and cares for widows and orphans. So when James says that pure and undefiled religion is this, you see that phrase there at the beginning of verse 27, pure and undefiled religion and the sight of our God and Father is this. He does not mean to give us an exhaustive list of what it takes to be a Christian, as if controlling our tongue and caring for widows and orphans are the only things that are expected of us as believers. But remember, James is like what? What did we say? Salt. James is like salt. So everything he tells us is supposed to season and flavor what we know about being a Christian so that we'll become complete and wise Christians. So James is saying that those who call themselves Christians ought to at least control their tongues. And we'll learn later that the reason for that is if you can control your tongue, you can control your whole self. <laughs> if you can control your tongue, if you have mastery over your tongue, you can master your whole self. And, and James is saying that those who call themselves Christians ought to at least care for those who can't care for themselves. Those are the orphans and the widows. Remember, widows and orphans in ancient times in the world of the Bible, did they have a way to support themselves financially? No, yeah, they were, they were destitute. So they had to rely upon the church for help. So if we remember anything from this section, I want us to remember that those who claim to identify with the teachings of Christ, those, those who call themselves Christians, are going to act like Christians. So according to James, they're going to act like Christians, and that means at least exercising control over yourself and caring for those who can't care for themselves. So you exercise control over yourself, and you care for those who can't care for themselves. And, and this kind of sets us up for where we're going, but that's really the, the minimum fruit that we need to look for in our, in our life. There are other things, but that's, that's sort of the, the minimum fruit that we need to look for in our life. If we're going to claim to be Christians, then we need to, we need to see those things uh, in, our, in our lives. All right. Next, we, we have uh, wisdom for relationships, and especially wisdom for relationships in church. And, and the thrust of, of James' message here is that we're not supposed to show partiality. And he, he, he means especially here uh, partiality between those who have means, those who have wealth, and those who do not. So He's just said, care for the widows and the orphans, and he uses that as a springboard into his next topic, which, as we said, is show no partiality, because the gospel does not discriminate between the rich and the poor. So if the gospel does not discriminate between the rich and the poor, then neither should we. So James says in two, chapter 2, verse 2, he says, 
My brothers and sisters, do not hold your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of personal favoritism. For if a man comes into your assembly with a gold ring and is dressed in bright clothes, and a poor man in dirty clothes also comes in, and you pay special attention to the one who is wearing the bright clothes, and say, you sit here in a good place. And you say to the poor man, you stand over there, or sit down by my footstool. Have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil motives? So to discriminate against the poor and to give those who are rich a preferential treatment is, is antithetical. That's a big word that just means completely against uh, God's design for building his kingdom. So to give rich the rich preferential treatment, especially in the context of, of a church, is completely against how God has designed uh, his kingdom and the building of his kingdom. In Luke 6.20, Jesus says, blessed are you who are what? He says, blessed are you who are poor. Well, here in Luke, it's just blessed are you who are poor. I think that's probably implied. Um, in Matthew, it says poor in spirit, but in Luke 6, 20, Jesus says, blessed are you who are poor for yours is the kingdom of God. And in Matthew 19, 24, Jesus says, and again, I say to you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. So the New Testament teaches us that God's kingdom is made up of those who are poor. So why is that? Um, well, the poor don't have material wealth to fall back on. They can't turn to their money for security. And so they turn to the only thing and the only person they can turn to. And who is that? That's right. They turn to the Lord Jesus. They turn to God. So the poor are humble enough to admit that they need God. The poor are humble enough to, to admit that they need God. Well, the rich are proud of their wealth, um, and they think that they need nothing. And one of the things that we know about God is that he resists the proud and he draws near to the humble. In fact, that, that's here in James. That's here in James chapter 4. He gives grace to the humble and he resists the proud. So what does it say about a church that prefers those who are rich over those who are poor? So a, a church that would, that would coddle up to the rich instead of identifying with the poor, is a church that has its priorities out of whack. It's a church that would rather see big numbers on a budget sheet um, than, than see lives change to the power of the gospel. And it's a church that would get so wrapped up in being bigger and better that it would give the most power to the folks with the most money, and they would let the money set the agenda. Okay, so, so don't misunderstand me, all right? I, I'm thankful that, that God has, has blessed some so that they can bless others. Now, that's not what I'm talking about. There are plenty of wealthy people who are good stewards, who give freely without any expectation of a return. Um, but we must never forget, okay, that, that our God is a God who identifies with the poor. And... Uh, you know, the kingdom of God is, is built upon the widow's might and not the rich man's dollar. And so God shows mercy to the humble and he blesses faithfulness. And again, I want to say it's not wrong to have money and that there is grace for people with money. Um, but we've got to reject the attitude that says, well, we're going to build our church with money. And the way that we're going to do that is we're going to coddle up to to the rich folks, and we're going we're gonna to let them set our agenda. We're going to let their, their money take us where we need to go. That's just not how the kingdom of God is built. And um, I think that, that we, there is a place to, to spiritualize this a little bit. You know, uh, like, like Jesus says in Matthew, blessed are the poor in spirit. And that doesn't necessarily imply that, that somebody who's poor in spirit also is, is, is financially poor or financially destitute. But I think when we come to a passage like this in James, we've got to be honest about what it says 
and we can't just over-spiritualize everything. And it does, even today, at least in one sense, speak into our pocketbooks. And, and that hurts, doesn't it? Uh, it? It makes me think about, you know, what my priorities are in life. Um, do, I, do I think that the way that we should, we should build things, or the way that I should build things in my life is, is through money, or am I going to trust the Lord to provide and, and, and care about the things that He has told me I should care about? So, any questions about that? So I want to be clear, God does not hate uh, those who have money, um, but there is an attitude that often accompanies that, 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 is, that is antithetical to the way that, that God has designed his church to be built, okay? All right, moving on to number four, we call wisdom for discerning a profession of faith. So faith without works is dead. If you thought what I just said was controversial, we're going to take another step uh, a little bit deeper in the controversy. And so, um, like I said, we've come to probably the most controversial passage in the whole book of James. So verses 14 through 26 of chapter 2. So this is the part of the letter that made Martin Luther question whether or not James even belongs in the Bible. So I don't want to make you hold your breath. right? I believe that, that this passage is in harmony with the rest of the New Testament. Uh, I do want to read the entire passage with you, and while I read, I want you to follow along closely. I don't want us to approach this passage with fear, but I do want us to approach this passage with reverence and with humility, like we've already talked about. We've got to approach all Scripture with reverence, and so don't dismiss it flippantly because it's got something very important to say to us. All right, so I know that your brain is going to be doing mental gymnastics when you read this. Try to figure out how in the world does this fit with what I know already. But just read it. Let it wash over you. Let it, let it say what it says. So beginning in verse 14, it says, What use is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone says he has faith, but he has no works? Can that faith save him? A brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food. And one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and be filled. Yet you do not give them what is necessary for their body. What use is that? In the same way, faith also, if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. But someone may well say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without the works and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one. You do well. The demons also believe and shudder. But are you willing to acknowledge, you foolish person, that faith without works is useless? Was our father Abraham not justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was working with works, and as a result of the works, faith was perfected. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, and Abraham believed God. And it was credited to him as righteousness. And he was called a friend of God. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. In the same way, was Rahab the prostitute not justified by works also when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way? For just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. So all of that is well and good. Uh, but then we remember what Paul says in Romans 3.28, which is, For we maintain that a person is justified by faith apart from works of the law. That's Romans 3.28. And again, for reference, James 2.24 says, You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. Yikes. <laughs> so the way I see it, we've got two options. We can dismiss these two verses as contradictions, or we can trust that the Lord does not contradict himself in his word, and we can dig a little deeper. So I hope you'll choose the second one with me. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to try to dig a little deeper and see what's going on. So I think we've got to understand James not as refuting 
Paul's teaching about justification, but as refuting an abuse of Paul's teaching. Okay? So there were some that were abusing the teaching of Paul. So someone who hears only that a person is justified by faith apart from works of the law might be apt to say, well, all right. I've got a free pass now to sin however much I want. I don't need to live in a way that pleases God because God is already pleased with the Son who has taken my place as a sacrifice for my sins. And of course, Paul himself teaches and is aware that his, his teaching is being misunderstood in this very way. He says in Romans chapter 6, verse, verse 1, he says, What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? And what was Paul's response? Amen. Yeah, may it never be. Far from it, he says. Uh, if it were said today, he'd probably say something like, heck no. <laughs> All right, heck no. Far from it. So we need to realize that the central question of Romans, right, that's, that's Paul. The central question of Romans and so much of what Paul teaches is how can sinful people enter into a relationship uh, with the perfect and holy God of heaven? And his answer is justification by faith alone apart from works. And by justification, uh, Paul means a declaration by God that someone is righteous based upon what Christ has done and their place. So that's known as, as forensic justification. Have you guys heard that word before? Forensic? So it's kind of like a, a law term. But, but when Paul is teaching about justification, that word justification uh, gets loaded with this meaning. And again, it's that, um, that it's a declaration by God that someone is righteous based upon what Christ has done in their place. All right, so we're clear on what Paul is doing in Romans and in other places. So James, I think, assumes that we have a working knowledge of this truth, and he seasons that truth. Remember, James is like salt. He seasons that truth with the teaching that faith without works is dead. So remember, James's main concern is giving us wisdom for the Christian life. He's not so much con concerned with teaching us theology, though he does do that to a certain extent. Um, he's not so much concerned with doing that as he is uh, with, with making sure that our right theology has been made complete, been made perfect by a right living. So James, unlike Paul, he's not teaching about what we call forensic justification, he, he doesn't load that term there with, with all of that meaning that Paul does. James's concern is that once someone has been justified, do they prove that they've been justified by engaging in, in, in acts of service and love? All right, so I'm going to give it to you another way. Another way we might think about this is that Paul gives us what justification looks like from God's perspective, and James gives us what justification looks like from a human perspective. And I think that this is a helpful way to look at this because they both use the same example. And Paul in Romans 4 uses Abraham as an example of someone who was, who was justified by faith apart from works. And Abraham uses, uh, uses, or excuse me, James uses Abraham as an example here in James chapter 2 as someone who has been justified uh, but is, is proven to be justified uh, by having a faith that is living and not dead, a, a faith that, that trusts God and engages in the work that, that God has for those who have been, have been saved. So uh, from, from God's perspective, uh, as soon as someone genuinely professes faith in the Son, that person is justified in God's sight and is declared righteous. So God doesn't need to see the proof of justification because he sees all and he knows the future and he knows the hearts of those who genuinely profess faith in Christ. So again, I don't, I don't want us to misunderstand. It's not, the, it's not even the, the work in the future that save us, saves us. It truly is God alone, by faith alone, that saves us. But God knows all and he sees all and he sees that, that faith being worked out in works in the future. Um, but, but I think it is an accurate thing to say that, that, um, that those who are righteous are justified by faith apart from works, especially when we think about this uh, in Paul's writings and we think about this from God's perspective. So that's God's perspective, okay? 
Everybody tracking with me? Now, from our perspective, we can't see into people's hearts, all right? We can't know just, on, just based on what somebody says that they've made a genuine profession of faith. So we can't see that someone has been unjustified uh, unless they uh, engage in good works. So in a very real sense, from our perspective, good works, um, they vindicate someone who, who claims to know the Lord. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. That's that. No, that is true. It does. It does give glory to God alone. But from our perspective, we can only see what what people are doing. And what I'm saying is, when people engage the power of the Holy Spirit and good works that it does, in a sense, vindicate what they've said. And so... So it's God's work within us. Well, sure. Instead of our own work that we would brag about. Correct. James is talking about. Well, I think that's, I think that's true. But again, I, 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 I want us to think about James um, as as kind of seasoning what, what the rest of the New Testament says. And, and I'm... And I hear exactly what you're saying, and I believe what you're saying is true. I just think that we need to be careful about softening what James is, is telling us. Because when it hits us, it hits us really hard. You, you know what I mean? I, I don't think that's startling you. I think it's just really giving glory to God. What you did, you know, with the Holy Spirit, if you yep. work outside right. of the Spirit, that's a no-no. Well, right. And, I'm, that's, and I am not saying that anybody can do good works apart from the Spirit because uh, James is calling this faith a living faith. And if we were dead in our trespasses and sins, then the only difference is, is that now we have the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit is animating us and giving us a living faith. So I agree completely, completely with what you're saying. I just think that from our perspective, we've got to hear James' words, and we've got to, we've got to really uh, take them as a warning. And we don't need to be scared. We don't need to be concerned whether or not we've actually been, been saved. Uh, but we need to look at our hearts, and we need to, we need to search and work out our, our salvation with fear and trembling and say, okay, God, uh, is this fruit there? Is, is this fruit in my life there? Does that make sense? I don't want us to, to just easily dismiss James as saying, well, I know that's what he, he says, but that's not really what he means. I think he means exactly what he's saying. I just think he's not loading that term justification with everything that Paul has. I think he's just saying that, that someone who has, who has saving faith, someone who has been justified, their, their, their justification, uh, their, their profession of faith is vindicated when, the, when they engage in, in good works. Does that make sense? So I agree completely with what you're saying. I think we're saying the same thing. Yeah, we, I think we are. I think we are. I think we are. Um, but just as another example of, of thinking about justification from, from a human perspective, if I were to tell you, hey, I can run a mile in less than two minutes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. So if I say, hey, I've professed uh, faith in Christ and I've been justified in the sight of the Lord. Yeah. From, from a human perspective, I think it's all right that we say, well, show me, <laughs> you know. Now, God doesn't say that because God knows that, that we have been justified uh, in his sight and he sees only Christ when he looks at us. God needs no proof. But just as we're, as we're working out what the Christian life looks like here on earth and as we deal with each other and as we, we deal with our own sinful natures, we've got to have this wisdom to be able to discern, okay, is what they're saying, is what I'm saying true? And the wisdom that James gives us is, well, faith without works is dead. You need a living faith. That's the only way that as humans we can know. You can't know that I can run a two-minute mile unless I do it for you. Spoiler alert, I can't. 
and I'm not going to try. <laughs> I, I hope that I could run a mile without stopping um, in 20 minutes. But, yeah, <laughs> but, um, but, yeah, so is that helpful? Thinking about justification from God's perspective on one hand, that's Paul, and James is, is thinking about justification, uh, and he's not really loading that term with everything that Paul is. He's not really teaching us theology. He's just saying, you have, you say you have faith? All right, buddy, prove it. Yeah, show it. Does that make sense? All right, so I don't think that they're, yes, sir. Yeah, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. We don't, we don't engage in, in good works for, for our own glory. Yeah, that's... And I mean, we had uh, Dr. Sam Cassie was here years ago. Some of y'all might know him been here. He, he asked a question. He said, when's the last time you got a roast at the grocery store or cookie from cookie to somebody's house you know that they would consume and just get it to them? Yeah. Didn't expect anything in return. Right. Right. Yes, ma'am. Uh huh. Oh yeah. No, you are. You are exactly right. I I couldn't agree more with that statement. I hope I hope nothing I've said makes you think otherwise. Yeah. Yeah. I I agree with that statement completely. So now we've got to ask the question: if we've if we've kind of synthesized Romans and Paul. With James, we've got to ask the question: um, Why is this here? For what purpose is this here? And why did James, uh, through the power of the Holy Spirit, uh, construct these verses in the way that he did? I think we've got to be thankful that God has given us this reminder in James, because it keeps us from cheap grace. Cheap grace that says, "I'm saved, so I can live however I want." So indeed, we are justified apart from works, but those who have a living, saving faith will engage in good works, and they won't just tell their neighbor who's shivering in the cold, be warm. And so they'll give <laughs> the coat off their backs. And I'm not even saying that someone who has been justified will always do the right thing. Now, Paul has a lot to say about that. But um, it, it does at least make us pause for a second and, and, and shake us of the belief that, that we can live however we want, and it doesn't matter. Because I, I can say that somebody with that attitude might possibly have been justified and might possibly uh, be in the presence of the Lord someday uh, in heaven, but, but I think the Bible's pretty clear that having that attitude is really dangerous. And... and you know, if you're someone who is worried about this verse, when you see this verse, I don't want to speak for God, but I will say that you're probably okay. If you're someone who's worried when they see this verse and say, oh, goodness, and do I, do I live up to this standard? Do, what, I mean, what does this mean? Like, I know that I've placed my faith in Christ. You know, if you view this warning and take it, if you see this warning and you take it seriously, then, then my guess is that you probably know the Lord. Uh, I would be worried if you saw this warning and you, and you said, I don't need that. You know, I'm not even sure that James is part of the Bible. I'm, I'm living by faith alone and I can act however I want to. I think James is just, he's just making sure that, that we don't take that attitude. Does that make sense? Yep. And again, we, we do. We, we don't engage in good works for our own glory, but for God's own glory. And I think that James would absolutely... Agree with that. Any other questions about this this passage? I think it's a great book. Yeah, it's a good book. Yeah, isn't, it? isn't it? There's lots of stuff in there. Um, so we're going to keep going because <laughs> there's lots of stuff left. Now, at this point, we're going to start moving a little bit quicker because these passages are a lot less controversial. Uh, James says in uh, chapter 3, verse 2, he says, for we all stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able to reign in the whole body as well. So we're calling this section wisdom for self-control 
And James' teaching here is tame the tongue. Tame the tongue. So essentially what James is saying, if someone were able to control their tongue, that person would have mastered the art of self-control. So did anyone ever tell you growing up, uh, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me, or words can never hurt me, and I agree with you. In one sense, I, I understand why people tell their children this. Um, there's a certain amount of mental toughness that you've got to have to be able to survive in the world, and it's not wrong to cultivate in children a sense of, of mental fortitude, we might call it, mental toughness, so that they don't melt away every time somebody says something they don't like. But whoever came up with sticks and stones may break my bones, but words can never hurt me probably hadn't read James very closely. <laughs> because this is what a James um, says about the tongue, and by extension, our words. He says, and the tongue is a fire, the very world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our body's parts as that which defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of our life and is set on fire by hell. And he goes on to say, it is a restless evil full of deadly poison. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. So James seems to think that words can cause extraordinary damage. That words can cause extraordinary harm. So think about it like this. Um, does anybody remember how the Gospel of John begins? In the beginning, that's right. In the beginning was the Word. And who does the Word there refer to? Yeah, so Jesus, more specifically, is, is the Word of God. It refers to Jesus. Now, we call Jesus the Word of God because Jesus is the perfect self-revelation of God. So more than anything or anyone else, Jesus reveals to us who God is. The most special way that God has chosen to reveal himself is the person of Jesus. And as the Word of God... Jesus reflects God's character and being perfectly. Okay? And so in much the same way, when we speak our words, our word communicates our character and our being. So everything we say gives people a little glimpse at who we are, who we really are, who we really are inside. In other words, everything we say is a reflection of what's going on in our hearts. Just like everything that Jesus said is a perfect reflection of who God is. And God is good, the Bible says. And God is love. So when we don't speak in a way that's good, in a way that's loving, what does that say about us? So that's why a major part of becoming a complete Christian a whole Christian. Remember, that's, that's kind of the, the unifying thing that, that, that we've got here today. We want to be whole Christians who learn how to use the wisdom in James. Um, a, a major part of becoming a whole Christian is, is taming the tongue. So the more we become like Christ, the more our, our words are going to reflect Christ. And the answer to James's question in 3 verse 11, he says, does a spring send forth from the same opening both fresh and bitter water? The answer to that question is no. Right? And likewise, it should be incomprehensible that a Christian would use his tongue to curse others and praise God at the same time. All right? So our words are reflections of who we are. So let that, let that guide and direct what we say, because if we want to be like Christ, our words have got to reflect that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yep, self-control is 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 a is a fruit of the spirit. All right, let's see. There we go. Next section we're calling wisdom for knowing what's true, and we're going to start going faster. So, 
Uh, here we see that, that cl- those who claim to be wise, those who claim to know the truth, uh, prove that they really know the truth by acting in a way that is in accordance with the truth. So this is a fairly similar idea to the one that we, we looked at earlier. It's kind of just another way to say it. So we as Christians are called, are called not only uh, to know the truth, but to live the truth. We're not to be hearers only, but doers of the truth. Uh, so if the highest wisdom of God, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians one twenty four, is Christ, then it wouldn't make sense for someone to claim to be wise and then act according to envy and bitterness and strife because someone who knows Christ and, and therefore who knows, knows wisdom uh, is going to act according to the things that define who Christ is, which is uh, peace and gentleness and purity, because, because Christ is peace-loving and gentle and pure. And all of this really is just another way to say that right understanding is made perfect and complete by right living. So those who actually know the truth aren't going to make it their mission to tell others how much they know. That's not what people who know the truth uh, spend their time doing. Those who, who know the truth aren't going to be driven by, by selfish ambition. They're going to want to use the truth to sow righteousness and peace in the community. They're going to they're gonna want to use the truth for, for the better of the community that they're in. They're, they're going to sow righteousness and, and peace in the community. And they're in James chapter 3. Uh, verses 17 and 18, he says, But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peace-loving, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial, free of hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. And I think this is a way that you, as a body of believers, can, can uh, check those who claim to hold a certain amount of wisdom to teach. So you can look at the teaching that's going on in, in our church. Uh, you can say, well, is this teaching leading to uh, peace and righteousness? Or is it stirring up anger and division? And I think it's fair to connect this verse to teachers because at the beginning of of chapter 3, we didn't mention this, but it says, Do not become teachers in large numbers, my brothers, so you know that we who are teachers will incur a stricter judgment. So, James is is in prove it mode again. He's saying, oh, you want to teach? You think you have wisdom? Prove it. And prove it by teaching in a way that will sow peace and righteousness in the community. All right, so a true uh, wisdom, true wisdom uh, loves peace, and it, it sows peace in the community of believers. In fact, wisdom uh, that, that does not do that, James says, is straight from hell. It's demonic. Yep. All right, any questions about that? What's that? Yeah, it is humbling. <clears throat> Wisdom for overcoming worldliness is the next section. And uh, James's main teaching, main idea here is be humble. So speaking of the community of believers, James says that the source of conflict in the body is lust. He says, what is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? This is chapter 4, verse 1. Is the source not your pleasures that wage war in your body's parts? So I think that the imagery that James uses here of war is really helpful. Our passions and our lust, if we let them, can get ahead of us. And they can lead to all sorts of divisions and problems. Um, there are as many different passions and desires and lusts as there are people in this room. All right? There, there are as many <laughs> passions and desires, uh, different inclinations towards different things as there are people in this room. And, and, we've all, and if we all uh, give in to our, our passions, we'll be chasing um, something uh, different. Each one of us will be going in our, in our own way. And if we're all pulling in different directions, then we're no different from the rest of the world. And conflict is going to be the result of that. So if we all give in to our passions, our lust, then, then conflict is, 
is the, the inevitable result. But James gives us an antidote for this sort of worldly conflict, and that antidote is humility. Humility. So it's extremely difficult not to give in to your lusts and desires. And maybe I'm alone <laughs> in that regard, but I find that it's very difficult to exercise self-control when you really want something, even when you know that you shouldn't have that thing. It's really difficult to exercise, exercise a certain amount of self-control and, and master your, your lusts. And I think we have to come to the place in our lives where we admit that, that we can't overcome our desires and our own strength. And so we have to humble ourselves and we have to say, I want to do the right thing, but in my own power, I can't do the right thing. So we only have the power uh, to overcome when we give God our weakness and we, we cry out to him for strength. And that's what James means when he says, come close to God and he will come close to you. Uh, this is uh, verse 6, beginning of verse 6. But he, he says, but he gives a greater grace. Therefore, it says, God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit, therefore, to God, but resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come close to God and he will come close to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Uh, give God your weakness, and the Lord will, will give you his strength. Uh, Catherine and I have a, uh, like a, little, like a little plaque thing that, that sits in our, in our bedroom that says that. Give God your weakness, and he will give you his strength. And that does not mean um, that if you play basketball, <laughs> you can say, Lord, give me your strength, and I'll make this free throw. It does not mean that. It just means when you're, when you're dealing with a trial, when you're, when you're suffering, uh, when you know that you can't overcome temptation on your own, you've got to admit that to the Lord. And I think a lot of people, or at least I did at one time in my life, think that that is some mysterious transaction that 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 only super Christians might be able to engage in. Like, I'm going to give God my weakness. I'm going to reach down into my soul and pull up my weakness and give it to God, and he's going to give me his strength. I think you just need to start with, Lord, I'm, I'm weak. Just pray and just say, Lord, I'm weak, and I don't know what to do, and, and I'm tired. I've got no strength to be able to overcome this. Lord, will you see me through this? And you know, maybe, maybe for you, the Lord works this way that he touches you and then all of a sudden you feel like the Energizer buzzy, Bunny and you just got lightning flowing through your veins and maybe you feel like that, but that's not been my experience. The Lord over time, when you just cry out to God and say, I don't know what I'm doing, I've got no strength to do this, the Lord over time will work it out in your life and he will see you through something. And I wish that the Lord just automatically flipped the switch in your life. And sometimes he does. I'm not saying that he can't do that. But, but we've got to expect there to be, um, you know, we, we've got to expect the Lord to work in our lives over time. We approach the Bible and we read about crazy things that happen. We read about um, the, the sick being healed. And, and I believe that the sick can be healed today. And we read about... Um, things like people being raised from the dead. And, and we just think that, oh, well, that happened in the Bible and it seems to happen in every other page. So it must happen all the time. But really, you know, they were just as amazed by that as we are today. Uh, so I don't know why I've kind of ventured off the trail. I usually don't like to do that, but maybe you needed to hear it, that if, <laughs> if you're going through a difficult time in your life, don't expect... Um, there just to be an easy transaction where you say, all right, I'm going to give you this, that, and the other thing, and, and now, Lord, you give me this. Um, it doesn't necessarily work that way, but we are called to be humble, to give God our, our weakness, and, and he will see us through uh, a difficult situations. Does that make sense? All right. So um, be humble. Be humble. I think we can go ahead and, and move on. All right, this I'm calling wisdom for making plans. So the, the teaching here is 
that we've got to acknowledge God's sovereignty. So this is a fairly well-known little passage, and I'm going to read it all. It says, Come now, you who say today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city and spend a year there and engage in business and make a profit. Yet you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow, for you just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will, uh, we will live and also do this or that. But as it is, you boast in your ignorance. All such boasting is evil. Arrogance, rather. All such boasting is evil. So for one who knows the right thing to do and does not do it, for him it is sin. And I think this teaching is pretty clear. As we live our lives, our general attitude has to be one of deference. So we've got to give up what we want and yield to uh, the sovereignty of God. So like we said earlier, even as we have freedom to do what we, we want to do in one sense, we've also got to understand that the Lord holds our lives in his hand. So the Lord knows the number of our days and, and nothing this side of eternity is guaranteed to us. And any one of us could die today. I know that's morbid, but, but it's the truth that, that any one of us could be in an accident and, and die today. Uh, so to have your, your life so well planned out that you, that you leave God out of the equation, according to James, is the opposite of wisdom. It's foolishness. So it really is good practice to say, Lord willing, I will do so and so. And you might say, well, that sounds kind of cheesy just to say that over and over again. And uh, I, don't, I don't know that it is necessary to say it every time that you make a plan, uh, but it is good practice to at least let those words affect your attitude and affect the way that you live your life. So Lord willing, I will do this or that. Robin, you spoke about me earlier, and I get to speak about you. I hear you say that all the time. Lord willing. I think that that attitude that James is talking about here has, has really affected, affected the way that you live your life. Uh, so um, we need to be like that. We need to uh, say, if the Lord wills, uh, we, will, we will go and do such and such a thing. So wisdom for making plans. Number nine is wisdom for managing wealth. And the teaching here is give the workers their due. And he's touching our pocketbooks again. My goodness. So again, I don't want you to misunderstand. The Bible does not necessarily condemn wealth. It does, however, strongly condemn the misuse of wealth. And according to James here, one of the most heinous ways that you can misuse your wealth is if you withhold payment that someone's due. So there's a great deal of irony in these verses here because the wealthy people described in them withhold payment from deserving workers in an effort to store up their own riches. So they think by cheating the workers that are due their wages, they can uh, be better off financially, they can have a more secure future, but in storing up their, their riches, they don't realize that what they're actually storing up is the wrath of God. They think that they are providing security for themselves and their futures, but what they're actually doing is condemning themselves. And the cries of the workers, James says, that they've mistreated reach the ears of God, and God is going to vindicate them. So as we do business in the world, these verses are meant to give us pause. Uh, you may not own a business. You may not have fields full of workers, but I would venture to say that you have money. And I would venture to say that you shop at stores, that you go to restaurants. And listen, I understand and I get frustrated that in many restaurants, the, the expectation of tipping especially has gotten a little bit out of hand. But I would just pose this question to you, okay? When you go to a restaurant and the time comes for you to settle your bill, with what kind of attitude do you tip your server? Do you tip begrudgingly? Or do you tip with an aim towards blessing your server and being a good witness for Christ? And when you're given good service, especially, I understand that there are bad servers out there. I'm not talking about every situation. But when, especially when you're given good service, I hope that as a Christian, you tip generously. 
Right, and and I have a, a special, um, I guess, a special insight into this because in college and seminary during the summers and uh, at Christmas time, I worked at a restaurant, and um, I I saw one time a a group of four or five Christians come in, and they had a, a gospel track. And there's nothing wrong at all with a gospel track. I hope that if you, if you use them, that you'll continue to use them. If you found them uh, useful or fruitful, uh, helpful in, in explaining what the gospel says, that you use them. But this particular uh, person had a gospel track that looked like a $100 bill. And I've seen those, and, and maybe there's a use for those. But this person had a, had a gospel tract that looked like a $100 bill. And instead of leaving a tip, they left that. And they left it on the table. <laughs> and one of the most difficult things I've ever had to do, because these other restaurant workers that, that I was with, that I worked with, knew that I was studying to be a pastor, knew that I was in seminary. And so one of the most difficult things I've ever had to do was explain to a girl why a group of Christians left her a gospel track instead of a tip. I'm going to tell you, a lot, of, <laughs> a lot of restaurant workers don't have a lot of money. They're either preparing to do something else, like in my case, I was, I was fortunate and blessed enough to be able to have good support growing up and and, you know, the, my, my family instilled in me a good work, work ethic, and so I did well at a restaurant, and it prepared me well to do things later on in life. Some people never get beyond that. And, and that's not to say that there's anything wrong with them, but I'm just saying that there are a lot of restaurant workers who, in their mind, don't have a lot of hope, and they don't have a lot of money either. And when they see that someone has taken an interest in them, and left them a large tip. And then they come to realize, no, you know what? These Christians don't really care about me. They don't really care about my financial situation. They just care about my soul. They should have left the money in the, the track. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> now, you're thinking, now you're thinking like a Christian. So we are not just souls. Now, we will be in the presence of the Lord. Our souls, when we die, will be in the presence of the Lord. But God has made us to be bodies and souls, hasn't he? And so when we neglect one or, or the other, uh, we are not acting in a way that is, is Christ-like. Jesus was concerned with people's souls, and he was concerned with, with people's physical well-being too. And that's one of the major things of James. Remember earlier uh, when he says, uh, we talk about faith without works being dead. The example that he uses is someone who comes along to their brother and sister and just tells them, be warm, but doesn't give them any warmth, doesn't give them their coat. Um, and that tells me that that James and, and the rest of the writers of the Bible and, and must mean that God cares about our, everything that we are. He cares about our bodies. He cares about our, our souls. And it's important to remember that we do look forward to being in the presence of the Lord in heaven. But there's a word that we use for that that's not used often anymore. I wish it was, but we call that the intermediate state. And we call it the intermediate state because one day the Lord is going to resurrect our bodies and we're going to be made whole again and we're going to live forever, forever on the new heavens and the new earth. And so our ultimate hope is being a complete person, body and soul, and living in God's presence. And so don't neglect bodies. Don't neglect people's physical well-being because those things matter and God has made them and, and he's going to redeem them. Okay, am I making sense? So as Christians, I know that not all of us in here have uh, businesses, have fields, have, have, have things that we've got to look after. We don't pay workers regularly. But we can do little things like tip well 
especially when somebody gives us good service. And even when somebody doesn't give you good service, still leave a little bit of something, you know. It's, it's the least that we can, we can do as Christians to make sure. Yes. You have a tip app on your phone that tells you? That's cool. Well, good. Well, I hope you keep using it. Yeah. Well, yeah. And I. Right. Right. I think prayer is powerful. In fact, the very next. Um, right. That that's what's behind James. Like if if Miss Bev were over here shivering cold and and she said, I need help. And I said, I said, Lord, please warm Miss Bev up. In the name of Jesus, Amen. Yeah. <laughs> would that do anything? Well, maybe the Lord would work through that. Maybe in, super, in in a very special circumstance, the Lord would would work in that. I'm not saying that He can't do that, but more often than not, it's let me give you my coat, and that's how the Lord works. All right. Yep. All right. So one last thing here. Uh, wisdom for waiting, and the waiting is is for the Lord. Wisdom for waiting. Uh, we've got to be patient, and we've got to pray. So James closes the letter by giving us some wisdom for waiting on the Lord. He says that the coming of the Lord is near, and that in the meantime, we need to be like prophets and like Job, who endured suffering in this life, knowing that the Lord was compassionate and merciful towards them. And he'll be compassionate and merciful towards us when he comes again. And while we wait for the Lord, James says we're supposed to pray. So instead of worrying about tomorrow, um, we, we're meant to, to lay our requests at the feet of Jesus. So prayer is our response to uh, any and everything that, that life has to throw at us. If we suffer, we should pray. If we're cheerful, we should offer up prayers of praise. If we're sick, we should pray. If we need forgiveness of our sins, James says we should confess our sins to one another and we should pray. So prayer should be our constant business as Christians. All right, so one last thing I want to mention and we'll be done. Remember uh, that uh, what I wanted us to take away from this is that we, we need to be whole Christians. We need to be whole Christians. Uh, James is very much concerned with, with being whole. I know that today's survey probably was a little bit scattershot with all the topics that we had to cover. And I don't expect you to be able uh, tomorrow to just rattle off these 10 things that we've, we've talked about. But I do pray you'll remember one word, and that word is whole. So can you say that with me? Whole. So remember that having a correct understanding of Scripture means nothing if you don't also do what it says. So in order to be a whole Christian, you've got to heed the wisdom of James by believing correctly and living correctly. Okay? Any questions? All right, let me pray for us and then we'll be dismissed. Father God, I thank you for this time. Uh, Lord, I thank you for the book of James. I thank you for the way that it seasons and flavors our Christian lives. Lord, help us to apply uh, what it says as we, as we live. And Lord, we love you, and we pray these things in your name. Amen.